Hello, and thank you very much indeed to everyone who's tuned in uh, to this talk. Uh, I should let you know that I am not speaking as an MP, let alone as a government minister. I'm speaking as someone who's interested in ideas, have training in philosophy, uh, taught the subject at one point, and is keen to think about where these important concepts came from and what they mean and whether we can think about them productively for the future. So uh, the talk is the virtues of commerce and let's crack on in the first uh, slide and just start I think by pausing for a moment to ask ourselves where we are now in particular because a global pandemic has swept uh, across uh, countries and continents uh, and has brought us all into, I think, a, a new sense of the fragility of our own lives, perhaps, or our society, our nations, and perhaps our interrelationships with each other, personal and national. So COVID forces us to think about what it is we care about, what it is we cherish, and what we wish for the future. And that's an incredibly important thing. Uh, I've called it a COVID revolution because... Of course, some people, many people, uh, and in particular, many people from the left of politics and of uh, political thinking, uh, and I have in mind people like Judith Butler, or in this country, perhaps Amir Sunivasan, or in America, Katrina Forrester, have thought about uh, this as potentially a moment where we could take stock and uh, potentially uh, uh, there might in, in due course be cause for a revolution that overturned uh, the um, values that they take to be uh, intrinsic, or some of them take to be intrinsic to our current way of life. And, and of course, if you think that uh, contemporary society is, is um, preoccupied with and only a matter of inequality or domination of uh, class on class or a certain kind of uh, elite hubris, then of course that revolution is going to be incredibly welcome. And, and of course, I, I, there are elements of all of these things and you, you don't have to look far to see them. Uh, but I'm going to argue that actually commerce and uh, what can be called commercial society have virtues and values of their own. And we need to reflect on those before we think about revolutionary change that we might want to impose uh, on them. Now, if we think about society, uh, a simple classification that would be widespread might be a distinction into agrarian or industrial societies, uh, a distinction perhaps between uh, capitalist and uh, communist societies. Uh, but of course, there is, seems to be a kind of fixed expectation in uh, many people's minds and perhaps in many countries that the future in one form or another is about some form of capitalism. Now, I'm not sure that that's true uh, at all. And for reasons that we'll come to, I'm not sure that's really what we should be thinking about, particularly. But it's worth just noting that there are different varieties of capitalism available uh, around the world. There are what you might call countries with um, Western-style uh, liberal democratic capitalism. Uh, there is China, which combines communist uh, politics with uh, capitalist uh, economics. Uh, there are countries that are based on uh, economies that are dominated by the armed forces or in some cases by a particular interest, might be drugs in some cases in the past, uh, historically, or in some cases perhaps today, uh, or it might be other forces that shape the nature of the capitalism that they have. So even capitalism itself is not a settled uh, or unitary category. And I think it's important to note that up front. And of course, how countries achieve whatever state of development they have may itself be wildly different one from another. There may be countries that have come together, uh, as Germany did, out of duchies and principates in the 19th century. Uh, there may be countries that have at, uh, at, uh, achieved or enjoyed a, a fairly stable, unitary political status, as this country has, of course, with disagreements over the years since uh, the early 17th century uh, or the early 18th century, depending on how you think of it. Uh, and, of course, there are a host of different uh, options and different possibilities uh, in between. There will be countries that have been uh, and still bear the legacy, positive or negative, of colonialism, of empire, and uh, many other different pathways to the current state that they have. And these things interplay with each other. One thing, however, that does seem to be characteristic of our current era is not just the um, assumption that somehow capitalism, perhaps following the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, in 1989, is some form of inevitability, but also that 
the way to think about these things is through the lens of economics. And economics is the mechanism by which we should uh, evaluate uh, the strength or well-being of given societies. And it's economics that should be the uh, principal guiding tool when we come to make trade-offs between uh, people uh, or interests uh, within countries and across countries over time. So that really is a way of just setting the scene for uh, the argument that I want to make. Uh, now, I want to start with a great hero of mine. I've written a book about him, uh, Adam Smith. Uh, of course, not necessarily familiar to everyone in his own, uh, in his own full being. Um, I think everyone would think of him. Many people think of him as the father of economics. Uh, and in the sense that economics comes of age with the placing of markets at the center uh, of that body of thought, then I think that's an appropriate description. I mean, there, there is economics, plenty of economics before Smith uh, wrote The Wealth of Nations, but all economics afterwards bears its stamp in different forms. And it does so because it is so emphatically focused on uh, the functioning of markets and the benefits and, of course, the drawbacks uh, of markets uh, as part of a wider scheme of an understanding of how societies and how economies uh, develop. And for Smith, the crucial change that he had seen uh, in British uh, history, uh, in Scottish history, and that was powering its way through in his own lifetime, was the transition from what he took to be feudalism to commercial society. Now, what was that change? Well, for Smith, feudalism is marked by personal dependency. So you might have a lord of the manor or a great aristocrat or indeed ultimately the king or queen and arising from that source of authority and power and wealth, there would be a relationships of a personal dependence uh, working their way through society. And you have, of course, in the 16th century and afterwards, this idea of the great chain of being that somehow people's function is defined by where they sit in society and that's all they can ever aspire to and all they should aspire to uh, and that somehow that is divinely licensed and uh, ratified. Now that view is one that he takes, Adam Smith takes, to have been decisively superseded uh, in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries uh, and that is through the move towards, towards what he calls commercial society. And a commercial Commercial society, for him, is, he has a lovely phrase, description of it. He says it's a society essentially in which um, every man, of course, uh, he's only talking about men as was the time, uh, the practice of the time, uh, every man is in himself, as it were, a merchant and lives by exchanging. So it's a society of exchange, and it's a society in which people in the act of exchanging uh, treat each other as presumptive equals. They may not in fact be equals economically or uh, in terms of the hierarchy or status or the other ways you might think about it, but they treat, them to treat each other for the purposes of exchange presumptively as equal. And therefore, uh, he sees that as a much more uh, equal and indeed equalizing uh, set of social arrangements than feudalism, and one that's not marked by personal dependency. You need have no direct personal relationship with someone if you're exchanging. Adam Smith one point points to his coat and speculates on the uh, innumerable trades that may have been involved in producing the dye and the wool that it's made from. And, and of course, he need have no knowledge of the people who did the dyeing or generated the dye itself or did the carding or the combing or the weaving of the coat. Um, and he doesn't need to because uh, the action of markets through society is what guarantees uh, the availability of a coat to him and, and ultimately its quality. So it, a commercial society need not be one that relies on personal relationships as such uh, or indeed personal dependency. So that's the broad picture. And what is so interesting about that, of course, is that uh, somehow this idea of exchange has been preoccupied in people's minds by uh, economic exchange. And of course, that is a central part of the wealth of nations. But of course, that misses out what you might call its moral dimension. And for Smith, uh, all exchange has a moral dimension. And uh, he wrote a book before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which talks about how that moral dimension to our lives, how value, how norms uh, are generated uh, in society. And what he says is extraordinarily interesting. He says that... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below.
Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.